Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Money Matters event for this evening. We're so glad to have you all joining us for what we are really excited to present to you, which will be all about investing and retirement tips with our partners at 1AZ Credit Union. Now, while we give everyone some time to get logged in and settled, we're gonna go over some brief housekeeping tips just to make sure that we are all on the same page for a wonderful event tonight. So this is not likely your first time using Zoom considering the last two years we have all experienced together. But in case it is, or maybe your first time using Zoom in an academic setting, we do ask that you please um, be aware of how your name appears on the Zoom profile. And if it's not showing us your first and last name, we welcome and invite you to update that. You're also welcome to include your pronouns if you wish. That way we can get to know you a little bit better and also refer to you properly throughout tonight's event. It will also help us reconcile and grant attendance credit where it is due. And if you didn't already know, if you attend all three of our Live Money Matters events for this semester, you will be entered in a drawing prize for a $250 tuition award to be applied here at Pima. So that's especially a great reason to make sure that we know who you are and can grant you that attendance credit where it is due. If you're not sure how to rename your Zoom profile, there's a couple ways to do so. Option one is to look down at your Zoom uh, toolbar, click on the tab that says participants, and you're going to see a pop-up box. Find your name on that list and then hover your mouse over the blue box that says more, and it will give you the option to rename your Zoom profile. Another way to get there is by hovering your mouse or clicking on your webcam window, even if you don't have it on right now. You're gonna see three little dots in that top right corner, click on them, and again, it will give you the option to rename that Zoom profile. Worst case scenario, if you're not able to figure out options one and two, you're welcome to send myself, Juanita, or Carla a private message, and we will help get that fixed for you. Now, please be aware that this presentation is being recorded for educational and promotional purposes, and we will be sharing this out later on our YouTube page for online engagement. It's also a great way for you to reference back on everything that you learned from today's event, and it makes the topic available for those who are not able to attend live. If you do not wish to be part of the recording, you are welcome to leave your webcam off. You will still be able to fully participate in tonight's activities. But if you would like to turn it on, we welcome you to do so. It's another great way for us to see who all is joining us today. So I see Stephen is with us tonight. There is Scott again. Great to see you again, Scott. I see some other folks. It is wonderful to have you joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Please know that captions are provided this evening and that would help you be able to follow along and learn. To enable those captions through Zoom, just go back down to your Zoom toolbar, click on that three little dots that say more and then select the option to show or enable those subtitles. Now, in order to make sure that we can all easily hear and understand the speakers at hand, we do ask for you to please keep all microphones muted throughout this presentation. We want this to be a fun space and a safe space. And so please make sure that you also keep all conversation clean, respectful, and civil throughout tonight's events. Now, in addition to all of that, we also want this to be a place where you can get your questions answered. So at any point throughout tonight's event, if you have a question, please feel free to ask it through the Zoom chat. And we will make sure that those questions get addressed throughout tonight's event, especially when we have specific time designated for Q&A towards the end. Last but not least, we will be asking everyone to please complete our feedback survey through the tiny URL link that you see on the screen and which will be shared in Zoom chat with you later tonight. We're just giving you a heads up about it now, but make sure that you do not leave the event until you have completed that because that's going to be how your attend attendance is officially recorded so you can get entered in that drawing prize for the $250 tuition award. 
All right. So um, if you also are not already doing so, please make sure that you follow us on our social media accounts. In addition to the $250 award uh, prize drawing, we're going to have some immediate drawings uh, tonight for those who follow our social media accounts. And we will announce those winners later tonight. So make sure that you follow the First Gear Experience page at Pima FYE on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and then at Pima.FinancialAid.Scholarships on Instagram. And again, we will select two winners who follow each of those accounts um, and announce them later this evening, and you will get a special prize. And in case I didn't say it again enough, because it's really important and exciting, please be aware that when you attend all three of our live events this semester, you're going to be entered in a drawing to win that $250 tuition award. It can be used towards your spring 22 semester. More details on that later. But again, do not leave tonight's event until you have finished that post survey with us later. Now, tonight's event would not be possible without many hands uh, bringing everything together and helping to coordinate the details. So I want to take a time to give everyone uh, a moment to be able to introduce themselves and what their role is with tonight's event and the college and credit union. So we'll get things started with Carla. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Renee. Uh, my name is Carla Gonzalez. I'm the Assistant Director of Scholarships and Outreach here at Pima. So I'm very happy to see you all here joining us. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and introduce Juanita or let her introduce herself. Hello, my name is Juanita Bonillas and I work with Carla in the scholarships office. So we help students, everything scholarships with Pima. So if you receive a scholarship through the Pima Foundation or through the financial aid department um, at Pima, we're the ones who administer that and apply it to your account and all that. So if you have questions about scholarships, we're, we're your team. So I'm happy to be here. And for those who I have not yet met, my name is Renee Forsyth. I use she, her, and her pronouns. And I lead the first year experience program at Pima, which helps get all of our new students connected, especially within their first 30 credits or first year at the college, to make sure that we help you bridge your way over to completing your goals, i.e. graduation. And in addition to the Pima team, we have partnered with 1AZ Credit Union, and we have a great partner in Patrick. So please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Patrick, and for those of you who have attended these events, I'm sure you already know, uh, I am um, a Pima alumni, so I got my foundation from Pima, and uh, I do believe uh, Don is also from Pima as well, so uh, that's definitely um, a great way to uh, showcase exactly what Pima is all about, right? Um, so yeah, uh, I'm glad to be here, and I do have uh, my colleagues uh, from 1AZ, uh, uh, Don and uh, Tom uh, Mitchell here that are going to also help facilitate this event because it's a very important event uh, and topic, if you will. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Tom Mitchell. I actually uh, work alongside with Patrick, and my role with the uh, program is to bring investment services and counsel to all of the membership of the credit union. Uh, again, Tom Mitchell, and I'll tell you more about me and the program and all the things you're going to learn tonight a little later. I uh, just want to say good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Don Amico. I am a wealth management financial advisor through 1AZ Wealth Management covering the southern region. Um, and I cover three branches in Tucson located inside of 1AZ Credit Union. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be uh, answering most questions towards the, uh, the end of the program. And uh, I look forward to having a a great time and hope everybody enjoys the presentation. Thank you. So as previously mentioned, tonight's topic is going to be about investments and retirement. And we have a video to kind of get things started to introduce you to what we will be discussing tonight. Let me go ahead and make sure we are ready. And here we go. Welcome to the Wonga Money Academy. This time around, we'll be talking about investing, one of the four pillars of financial literacy. Investing means putting your money into something that will make you a profit. The something, otherwise known as your investment, can become a second salary, or it may become more valuable as time goes by. That way, if or when you sell, you'll make more money than you originally invested. What sort of things can you invest in though? 
property, retirement funds, unit trusts are some popular choices. When you invest in property, the plan is either to rent the space to tenants or to fix it up and resell it at a higher price. Investing in property is generally a good choice as the chance of your investment growing in value over time is excellent. Investing can also help you to plan for a comfortable retirement. There are different ways to do this. Some employers set up a retirement fund for their staff, who invest money in a fund while they're employed. They receive regular payments from the fund once they retire. Then there is the retirement annuity option. This is a private pension plan because rather than making payments into a group fund, the idea is to go it alone. You can choose between investing in the fund whenever you have extra money or keeping to a regular payment schedule like monthly or quarterly investments. You All right, so they are going to tell us a lot more about this in more detail. So without further ado, I hand the mic over to 1AZ. Hey, thank you so much, Renee. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Again, my name is Tom Mitchell, and I have the privilege of leading the 1AZ Wealth Management Team located there at the 1AZ Credit Union. We actually are registered with LPL Financial, the, one of the leading largest independent broker dealers in the country. So that gives us the ability to offer a variety of investment solutions and insurance solutions for all of the members of the credit union. Uh, there on the screen, you'll see our, uh, our appropriate disclosures that we need to always display. And uh, so the things I'll be talking about actually do involve risk. Uh, they do uh, have volatility and they may go up and down in value. So losing value is not uncommon on the short run. Uh, they're not insured by the credit union and they're not an insured product by the credit union. So, but the key is we're going to talk about all the facets of investing because my goal, and I think our goal tonight is to talk about how to help you build your own wealth plan. All right. So let's get started and let's see if I can get my uh, cursor to work here. Oops. All right. So. Uh, why is it not advancing? We just had it advance here a minute ago. You see it advancing? Nope. Not yet. All right. Let me just do a different square share screen. See if this one works. How about that? No. It is advancing, um, but it's not the slideshow. Oh, okay. It's well. We just had it there. Where did it go? Well, I'm seeing the slideshow and I'm seeing it in the edit mode with slide one on the left hand toolbar highlighted. All right. How about now? You just see the, the full screenshot? Yes. There you go. And it's a all right. All right. We're all good. All right. There you go. We have a, a, a QR code there. If you'd like to scan that code on your phone, it'll actually take you to our website, 1azwealth.com. There's a whole bunch of information out there on that website. Uh, let me just kind of blow it up a little bit bigger for some of us to see. You could also email questions to us at the end or later at 1azwealth at 1azcu.com and we'll get back to you. We have an appointment calendar. If anybody would like to have a, a personal consultation with any of our advisors, that's also available right on our website. And certainly you can call us uh, and actually uh, phone us and schedule an appointment or even just have a conversation with us uh, impromptu. But there you go. I do encourage everybody to check out our website. We put a lot of time in developing it because it has a lot of great content, materials, videos, and information that you'll be able to utilize later after the presentation. All right. Okay. So let's talk about how to build your wealth plan, right? That's what we're going to try to talk about. Well, there's my uh, handsome mug. <laughs> and uh, there's my email address if anybody needs to reach me. That's tmitchell at 1azcu.com. I've been in the industry a long time. I guess you can see there's some gray hairs there. Uh, I've just celebrated my 40th year in the industry as well as being licensed. I'm also a CFP. You can join and uh, link up with me on LinkedIn so that uh, uh, we could be friends as well there. And also you'll be able to see content that we share on LinkedIn. Don Amico is our wealth advisor that services the Southern region of the state. He's in uh, the Tucson market, so he's definitely available for any personal consultations. You're going to hear from Don a little later today, too, in handling questions that we'll be having from all of you, all right? All right, let's get started on the agenda. 
Uh, first of all, I've got a number of things I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about something called the OPM path. Uh, I'm going to talk about the five basic components of everybody's wealth plan. I'm going to talk about that, the one, two, three, four, five. And then I'm going to talk about how do you personally measure up and how you might want to be thinking about how you know if you're on track or not in the future. And then I'm going to do a little takeaways, right? Let's do a reminder of what are your key takeaways from today's presentation. All right, so let's get started. First is the OPM path, or some people call it the opium path. Uh, the OPM stands for three things. First is the O. The O is helping organize your financial affairs. And I call that out as that is the first step. Do you have your financial affairs organized? Do you know what you own? Do you know what you owe? And then having that all organized, at least looked at, that's called a balance sheet when we know what our assets are, our liabilities. And then if there's anything left over, if you take your assets minus liabilities, that's your net worth. And that net worth, that really becomes your balance sheet. Here's a, something I started many, many years ago. My wife's an accountant. She actually got this started for me, is on our birthdays, we would actually do a family uh, balance sheet. So in every, uh, about, and our birthday is about six months apart. So we've actually checked and we've been able to monitor, are we progressing in our financial net worth over the years of many, many years, or are we going backwards? The most important thing is to see how well you're doing over the long term. So organizing those financial affairs is one of the very first things we as advisors encourage all people to do. Whether you use us or work with an advisor, you should be managing your own assets a little bit. So you need to know where they all are located. The next step is taking a look at what you have, but also knowing those objectives. What are your goals and objectives? That's still part of the O. We wanna make sure what are your objectives? Do you wanna retire early? When do you wanna retire? Do you uh, wanna have a second business? Do you wanna have a second home? What are the components in your life financially that you would like to see become a reality? Well, that all has to be thought about, organized, set down, crystallized, and then a plan needs to be built, okay? That's the second part of the opium plan. And that's the P part. That now is planning. Sitting down and planning and projecting various scenarios that may play out. Everybody on this call, you're different ages and you come from different backgrounds and you have different goals and objectives. So each one of you will have your own plan or your own play out of your scenarios so that we can figure out, can we achieve your goals? And through our planning software that we use, uh, and you have there's software out there that you can get pretty much almost anywhere. If you Google it, and you can buy it, or you can just use some of the free models that are out there. The most important thing is actually go through the exercise, making sure what you're doing in your financial affairs are going to get you to where you want to go. Okay, you, you, know, you can't get there uh, without planning, planning and projecting. Once you do the planning and projecting, it doesn't stop there. No, nope, no. Nope. What you need to do is the M part, and that's the managing and monitoring. You have to monitor it. Like, like I mentioned, what I do is we do a balance sheet twice a year. So we get a little checkpoint to see, are we on track? Are we going in the right direction? So managing it as well as uh, monitoring it right, is critical because things change. Things are not what they were in the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s. Things have continued to evolve, continued to change, and we need to be flexible in understanding that as well. So, and then guess what? That brings us right back up to the O again, organizing, setting objectives, and then making sure we go through that same process all over again, the OPM, OPM, OPM. So it sounds simple, but it's very, very important that you do it, right? Uh, and I'm going to, I'll preach a little bit tonight because I'm very passionate about helping people improve their financial lives. And this is one of the first steps I'd like you to make sure you do. Okay. Now, as you build out your financial life, I do call out the financial pyramid. Some of you have seen this before. It's a common uh, descriptive here of financial, uh, building financial wealth, but you kind of start with a foundation. You build up from there to, to be conservative assets, as well as growth assets and speculative assets. So many times we see clients come to us or younger clients come to us and say, hey, we want to go for the speculative. We want to roll the dice. Let's go for it. Well, you know what? I do know uh, the more speculative things are, the higher chances of failure 
or loss will occur. And like, why are the why are the you know pyramids in Egypt so strong and, and have lasted centuries and centuries? Is because they were built with strong foundations. Here's an example of some of the things on those foundation points. On that foundation, what are your savings, T bills, annuities, money market funds, as well as life insurance? Yeah, life insurance. That's a strong asset that can help build out a foundation when you really don't have any net worth yet. So then you move up into the conservative investments. You can see what some of those are, utility stocks, bonds, uh, your residence, retirement plans, et cetera, some, and some bonds. You go up to the next level. Now you get into the growth where things will, will be more volatile in valuations. And that's when you get into stocks, mutual funds, et cetera. And then finally at the top are the most speculative things, the oil and gas, the metals, the, the artwork that people like to maybe buy for investment purposes, um, et cetera. So, the most important, and I just highlighted some of the key thoughts here, but making sure you have the foundation, you have a conservative as well as growth and a speculative part of your, of your plan. Another way you can look at this is you start, when you organize your financial affairs, I like to suggest you look at your financials and your assets in three pockets. One is the short-term pocket, mid-term pocket, and then the long-term pocket. And if you notice, these pockets are different sizes, aren't they? And they're different sizes because they meet different needs. Let me use Casey, for example, here. Casey actually has short-term, then that's what we look at is what do we want for short-term purposes? Well, we want to save money or have money liquid for the next 12 months if you have a need. For example, a birthday party, maybe some dental work, okay? Whatever those needs are, the assets you need for those financial events should be in the short-term bucket, okay? Or short-term pocket. <clears throat> then the next term, when you get into midterm, that's that one to five-year time frame, family reunion, a new car, perhaps, uh, kitchen remodeling, et cetera. And then the long-term, you get into the bigger expense items, new roof, maybe a college fund uh, or retirement accounts. The most important thing, though, is making sure you have your assets categorized in the right pockets. Part of that short-term pocket, let me jump back to that. The short-term pocket, I like to also make sure you include in there your emergency fund, your emergency fund. And people ask us as advisors, is that really important? And it is, it is important. Because as you start to build out your net worth and your investment plan, you wanna make sure you have a place where you can go and get dollars if you need them and not have to liquidate any of the investments that you might have in the long-term bucket or long-term pocket. You wanna have long-term things for long-term purposes. So in that short-term bucket, I'll give you another rule of thumb. You might wanna write this down. I like to use three to six months of your uh, monthly expenses. So three to six months of your month, normal monthly expenses, if you can have that set aside somewhat very liquid uh, or available to you for a need if an emergency would happen, a short-term disability, uh, you lose your job, maybe there's a layoff, maybe there's a cutback, whatever. You don't want to be scrambling and now dealing with financial crisis when those events happen. Trust me, been around a long time those do happen. So it's important to make sure you have it, you deal with it, and you manage through it. All right. So the three pocket analysis is a great way to get started to know where you might have some of your assets. Okay, let's get into the five components of a wealth plan. The five components of a wealth plan first starts off <coughs> with capital accumulation. Next is risk management. We're going to talk about retirement planning. We're going to talk about tax planning too as well as a legacy plan, all right? So let's do a deep dive on each one. The first one is capital accumulation. What is capital accumulation? Well, that's nothing more than a fancy word for investing. It's taking assets that we really want to set aside, have them grow for the long term. So there are investment strategies and there's investment selection. We could spend a whole webinar just on investment selections and also understanding strategies. But I wanted to call out the importance of just what capital accumulation means. Part of that capital accumulation is how to invest the money in different ways with different allocated positions with different assets. It's 
kind of like maybe you've heard the analogy, don't put all your eggs in one basket, right? Why put all your investments in one investment? Why don't we have it spread around? Because we don't know which one's maybe going to go up or go down next week or next year. So what we like to do is do asset allocation so that we can make sure we manage the risk better. That's part of the risk. And then monitoring and rebalancing, making sure you're always staying on track and on target for that. I like to show this chart. Wow, I know. There's a lot of colors and a lot of very, very detailed numbers and, and, and words on this chart. Let me do this. I use this chart all the time because I call it the, the jelly bean chart. The jelly bean chart, because look at all the colors, right? What is this an illustration of? Really, while well, this goes back to this, 2001, each year, each column is, one, is a year of performance. And at the very top is the best performing investment asset class. And the very bottom is the worst investment category that you could have invested in, all right? I'll reuse, look, go back in 2001, all the way in the far left on this chart, REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts, were the very best thing to invest in in 2001. It, it earned 15.5% uh, in that year. The worst investment was international investments, international stocks, et cetera. They lost 21% of your assets. Now, let's just take a look at that red box, all right? The worst performing investment class in 2001 turned out to be, in the two years later, it was the second best. In 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, it really screamed in performance. But then, bam, it dropped back down. Look in 2008, it only lost 43%, okay? So you can see that's huge volatility in one asset class. So what do we like to do when we talk to clients is making sure we understand what your risk tolerance is. How much volatility can you stomach? Another analogy I like to call out is what's your sleep factor? Everybody has a different sleep factor. If you take a look at the dark, the, the dark gray box, and you can see that kind of hovers right in the middle, doesn't it? It's never really high, but it's never really low. It's somewhere in the middle in a performance base. And that is what we call a diversified portfolio, a diversified for portfolio. So like if you look at the last 20 years from 2001 to 2020, a diversified portfolio would have averaged 6.65%. Not too bad, but that's average over 20 years. You didn't have the huge 30 or 40% drops, but you didn't have the 20% or 30% gains either. But it was a nice, strong average. And that's what sometimes portfolio management is about. I can spend a lot more time on this chart and a lot more detail, but we've got more things to cover. So let's keep going. The next category is what is your investment risk, right? I love this because I, we ask clients these questions like, all right, do I want my principal protected? Or they may say, well, I have a hard time tolerating risks. Sometimes they'll say, well, I can tolerate short-term risk. And some may say, yeah, I can even tolerate a moderate amount of risk. I could lose some money in the short-term or mid-term. Or, hey, I've got a long time. I've got 30 years before I retire. So I can be willing to take a lot more risk, a lot more volatility, but for the long-term potential gains, right? So, we put on together a little chart. You can see it kind of goes from low risk all the way to high risk. Low risk would be, for example, on the far left is cash. Cash, that's money you have in your savings or your checking account right there. There's really no growth to that at all. Um, but it's if you notice, it says principal preservation. It's something that is designed to provide protection and safety. Then you have certificates of deposit, fixed annuities, as well as fixed annuities. Then you step over the line into the blue box areas, and now we're talking about bonds and annuities and mutual funds and stocks, et cetera, which have much more volatility, but also has the potential for better growth in the long term. Okay? Here's another way to look at this chart. Everything on the gray side, everything on the left side is really for savers. That's what people do when they are looking just to save some money. 
They're saving it for a specific item in a very short-term period of time, usually, but for a specific item. Then you step over into the blue category. Those are now investors. People that have money, now they want to invest, take a little more risk, have a little more volatility, but with the mindset of hoping to hit and to attain, to attain better uh, returns. So there's a nice little play. Now, are you, can you be both? Can you be both? That's a good question. I think, yes, absolutely. You need to have a savings component to your portfolio and your assets, but it's also important to have some assets allocated towards the investor side. But it's a great little illustration I like to show to people. All right, here's a really good takeaway. I like to call this out because people try to compare investments. Geez, you know, it's pretty hard to how to compare one investment or or one investment category over another category. How, how do you do that, Tom? Uh, well, one of the things Dawn and I do is we talk about style, S-T-Y-L-E. Every investment or anything you're going to invest your funds in has a style about it, S-T-Y-L-E. Let's talk about what those letters mean. The first is S. You need to ask the question, how safe? is the vehicle or the investment that I'm selecting is. How safe is it? Does it, have, does it have FDIC insurance? Does it have federal insurance? Does it have state insurance? Does it have um, uh, guarantees tied to it that will protect the principal? Or does it not? Um, okay, that's important to know. You need to know what kind of a risk level of the principal you're taking in these investments. So safety of principle is a critical category. The next is tax treatment. Wow. And we're going to talk about taxes a little later, but tax treatment. Some are taxable. Yep. You got to pay taxes on them each and every year. Some are tax free. Guess what? You don't pay taxes on them. And then some are tax deferred, meaning that you're just simply deferring the tax to tax it later. Okay. So investments have different tax strategies. There's even a fourth category of taxation, and that's short-term, long-term. Some are even taxed better if you hold them for a longer period of time. Say over a year, you can actually get better tax treatment on certain investments. The next category that we always like to compare is, let's talk about the why. That is the yield. Does it provide a yield or does it provide interest? Does it provide growth, right? What, is, what, is, what are we trying to get out of this investment that we're making? Does it have a yield to it? How has it done performance in the historical basis? Also, how will it do in the future? The, the, the L stands for liquidity features. Some investments have no liquidity feature at all, right? I mean, I say that. Let me use an example. Would you say your residence is a very liquid asset? Nah, typically not because, you know, you just can't turn around and sell it tomorrow. Uh, but if you could, or if you did, sometimes you would really take a deep discount on the price or the value that you would get. You would take it as a very, very short-term loss because you're trying to force liquidity. <clears throat> so some investments have very low liquidity. Some are liquid within seconds or minutes on trading on the trading floor, uh, and that's also very, uh, has some very strong advantages to it because you can get to it at any time. Some only provide liquidity once a year. Some provide liquidity to a certain limit amount. All these different features of the investments you need to look at. Um, a like, for example, a five-year uh, CD. Uh, yeah, it's liquid, but you, you know, you're, you're buying it for the purposes of holding it for five years. Uh, it's not liquid necessarily for five years and in a good rate of return model. So liquidity features is important to figure that out and factor that in to your selection. The last item that I like to talk about when it comes to investments are, how will it affect my estate? Will my estate be affected differently with this investment or that investment? Well, yes, there are some investments that are a little bit more challenging to deal with when it comes to dealing with estate processing. Uh, some assets, wow, they're wonderful because they're actually designed to pass on to the next generation or to your heirs or to any heir that you would like to pass it on to. 
very easily, very quickly, very efficiently. Um, and so you have to think through what kind of estate issues am I setting my family up for or my uh, uh, the people that I would like to leave assets to or even a charity for that matter, if you're going to leave money to a charity or assets in that way. So look at every investment and compare the style, the S-T-Y-L-E. I will tell you, that's amazing how many clients we talk to that are actually late in their career and they never have done the true analysis of their investments when it comes to comparing it in this fashion. So look at that S-T-Y-L-E as you look at things in the future. All right, we talked about capital accumulation. Now let's get to the second area of the wealth plan and that's risk management. Risk management, I call out the four big risks that happen to people. One is disability, one is a premature death, property loss, long-term long, health and long-term care needs. Now, why do I call these four risks you have to think about? Well, <clears throat> if, you're, if you have a, a family set up or you even have a business for that matter, uh, a premature death uh, could affect people that you have left behind. And you need to be thinking about what kind of financial effects or financial impacts could that death occur and what would happen. When I talk about property loss, I think pretty much most people understand how important it is to have property loss insurance. For example, fire insurance on your home or, or your rental unit, tenants, tenant insurance. Uh, another is your automobile. If you have a vehicle, you generally will have auto insurance, right? Kind of by, by law, you need to have auto insurance because of the importance of insurance and taking, taking on that or covering that risk uh, element. Disability risk, I always call that the living death because you are around to see the consequences. Yeah, you're around to see the consequences of planning for disability. And some of you, if I asked you, uh, do you know anybody that, uh, have you ever known of anyone that died? You have, I would think every head would nod, yes, right? The mortality risk is still hovering right around 100%, <laughs> right? That's one thing we know will happen. Disability risk is a little different. <clears throat> we don't know if we're going to become disabled. What we do know is there's a large percentage of people that will become disabled. Will we be the lucky ones and not get disabled? Or maybe we won't be, right? Your key thought is, is you got to talk about it, think about it, and then plan around that. Long-term care needs. If I ask all of you, do you know anybody that's in a long-term care facility, a family member or a friend that you know of is aged to the point where they need assistance? Well, that's a real life scenario. That's a real life item. And um, we call that living, almost living too long in some people's mindsets is, geez, I didn't think I was going to live this long. I'm running out of money or I go into a long-term care facility and I use up my assets. Now, I don't want to be the doomer and the gloomer. I really want to make sure though you understand if you think about risk management and you make sure you take the right steps in that risk planning process, wow, it gives you freedom, it gives you flexibility, and it gives you the ability to do more in the investment categories with a lot better mindsets, all right? So the risk management, here's an example I'll just call out on the disability. People say, well, I'm never gonna get to save it. I don't know many people that do. Well, look at the stats, look at the stats. People to, uh, between 35 and 65, there's 12% that will be disabled, okay? So that's a big chunk. If you look at the people that are younger, yes, you see the disability percentage is way low. But as we age, the higher and higher potential and probability of a disability does occur. All right, let's get into the fun part, retirement planning, right? I think we all, if we had the desire, we'd all like to retire tomorrow. Well, the goal though is how do you do that? How do you do that? Um, one question that I'll say that Don gets and I get is, uh, well, I'd like to be a millionaire. Well, you know what? Let me say this, and I'll take a bold statement. Becoming a millionaire is not very hard to do. Now, what's hard is the steps you need to take to do that and to have it achieved, right? That's the important thing. People have it, they can get there. It's not a hard process. 
But the problem is a lot of people fail in taking the right steps. Let's talk about retirement planning. Some of you on this call may be a little older in your, uh, in your, in your time horizons here. So this may be more sensitive and more realistic to you. And we call out retirement income strategies because people in their 50s, and that's when we like to start talking about this really intensely, is because when you turn 50 or 55, we need to start thinking about the retirement strategies because there are key things you need to do and key things you should do in managing your assets so that you can achieve your goals in hitting your income during retirement. But you just don't, you can't wait till 65 or 67. Uh, in most of our cases now, it's 67 to get full retirement out of Social Security. You need to be thinking about it before that. So income strategies, managing your pension and your Social Security options. I just mentioned that too, right? Social Security is a big deal. That's about 20 to 30% of the retirement income stream that you need to be thinking about. Healthcare expenses. Wow. Healthcare expenses are a reality during retirement. You need to be aware of that and plan accordingly. And then you need to be thinking about the, ben the benefits that you have maybe at your employer. You might have a 401k or a 457. You might even have an IRA. And if I asked you all what an IRA is, you probably all say, I know what that is. That's an individual retirement account. Well, you know, when did the IRA start? Does anybody know when they started? Boy, that'll be a good polling question maybe for the next time we do this, Renee. Let me share this with you. It will, it will shock you that the IRAs have been around a long, long time. In the late 70s, early 80s, I will tell you, that's when the IRA concept came out. And that's when the accounts were uh, uh, put in place. And that became a venue for people to start to save for their own individual retirements. So it's not uncommon for me to come across a client that's had an IRA for 40 years. Uh, those IRA accounts have gotten quite large and they should have been, right? That's important because that's the goal. How do those accounts get so big? Well, making sure they have good investment selections is part of it. But one of the also important ingredients, and I'll talk about this a little later too, is the time you need to set aside money for investments. It's T-I-M-E, it's making sure you allocate the time to plan for that. Because one of the things we have to think about too, the second, I'll call it the, the taxation and inflation are the two evils when it comes to dealing with investment work or investment strategies. Here, <clears throat> I observe a chart, I go back to 1958. Let me take a sip here. The blue line on this chart are the inflation rates over those years. If you take a look in September the 30th of 1981, look at that rate, 15.84% was the inflation rate. Yeah, 1981. I'll tell you what, 1990, well, in that November of 1981, I bought my first real estate purchase uh, my mortgage was 12.5%. How about that? Who would like to have a nice 12.5% mortgage? Well, take a look. You can see how those rates have from 1981 to today have, if you just drew a line, it would be very easy to draw a line and it would all be pointing in the direction of downward, <clears throat> meaning interest rates have dropped over the last 30 to 40 years. Now, they've taken 30, 40 years to drop. Now they've zigged and zagged along the way. But if you can see, there's a gradual trend tendency for rates to go down. Now rates are moving back up. Inflation, December 31 of 2021, the inflation rate was 1.5%. However, if you look at the, total, the nominal rate, if you look at the real inflation rate today, you're looking at a much higher rate. I think the rate that came in last week actually talked about Inflation factor is somewhere around the seven and a half to eight and a half percent. Wow, wow. And if we have more time, I have some great information I can share about inflation. But I would like to show you, just to show you the importance of planning long term, inflation will impact your investments. The gray line are the, uh, the, uh, the yields off of, uh, I believe this is a 10 year treasury. 
This is the 10 year treasury uh, note that you can see where they have gone uh, when you impact it with the actual inflation rates, you can actually see they're so low, they're even in the negative category. So you can see everything below the line during those periods of time, people actually lost money even by investing it in treasury notes for five years or I see 10 years and because inflation was eating away at it. Now, a thing I haven't added to this is taxation. If you added taxation onto this, it even have a more dramatic impact. So taxes and inflation are the two evils that you need to be recognizing that's part of investment planning and strategy work, all right? Here's a good example, love this example. Uh, 1964, uh, if you had $100,000 and you bought a six month CD, well, the CD rates, a certificate of deposit uh, in 1964 was 4.5% or 4.3%. Well, your yield on that would have been uh, right around $4,000 a year, $4,300 a year. Guess what the uh, uh, manufactured suggested retail price of a Ford Mustang was actually $2,000. Uh, $368, you could actually almost buy two Mustangs from the interest off of that CD. Isn't that amazing? The annualized income, you could have almost bought two Mustangs in 1964. Well, let's go 20 years to 1984. 1984, well, guess what? The rate was up to eight and a half, or I mean, 8.8%. Uh, and the Mustang was now $7,000. So we had inflation, inflation went up. But take a look, you could have still bought a Mustang and you could have bought maybe 101 full tanks of gasoline <laughs> for that Mustang. Well, look, fast forward another 20 years. Now we're looking at 2004. Wow, CD rates are now down to 2.66. Uh, in income, maybe $2,660. Mustang, well, it's about $18,000. You can't even buy a Mustang. It says here, top end engine kit from your Mustang. Just to buy the engine kit for some of it would have been $2,600. But now we fast forward to 2021, the most current year. CD rates were way, way low. Uh, your annual income of $100,000 is about 180 bucks. Mustangs are selling for $27,000. You couldn't even get near that. What you could do with your $180 is maybe buy 3.7 gas tanks for refills. That's it. Wow. Huh? So this is a good way to illustrate the evils of inflation and how it really impacts our purchasing power over a period of time. I've lived through a lot of these years. Okay. So I know it. I felt it. Some of you that are just starting in your careers, I want you to understand when we're talking about the inflation issues we're dealing with right now, the seven, eight percent, that's a big deal. It really is. And I'm just fearful uh, that we got to get this under control. And I hope we do. All right. Uh, for the time's sake, I'll skip that slide. Let me talk, jump into the tax planning. All right. Tax planning. Wow. Can anyone tell me the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? Is there a difference? <laughs> well, there sure is. Tax avoidance, it's legal. Tax evasion, that's illegal. <laughs> That'll get you handcuffs. So you don't want to evade taxes. You want to avoid taxes when you can. The best way I like to illustrate tax avoidance is like a toll road. Some of you have been on a toll road. You could decide to take the toll road and pay the tolls or a toll bridge. You could pay the tolls or you could avoid it and go around, right? Maybe take a little longer way to get there or a different pathway or a different roadway so that you could avoid the taxation. Well, you could, and you should if you can, and there's ways of doing that when it comes to investing. So we want to talk about tax-free methods. We want to talk about tax-deferred methods, as well as taxable methods and understanding that. Managing your tax liabilities. Wow, that's very important. I don't know anybody, uh, very few people, if I ever ask, do you want to, how much taxes do you want to pay this year? Not too many people raise their hand and say, I want to pay more taxes. Well, I guess you could say yes, because that means you made more money. But in, in retrospect, though, who wants to pay taxes that you don't need to pay? And if there's ways we can avoid them or defer them, let's think about that and consider that seriously. And then knowing how to tax diversify. 
having a little bit that's taxable, a little bit that's tax-free, and a little bit tax-deferred gives you flexibility in your planning process. So I could spend a lot more time on tax planning, but I just wanted to highlight some of those key call-outs. I did want to show you this chart. I came across this chart and I had to smile. This chart shows you the highest, the, uh, the highest tax bracket that was on the tax table at that particular year. And it goes back to 19, I don't know, 1910 or 1912 or something. But look at the year 2020 or the year 2000, I'm sorry, 1920. 1920, the tax, the top tax bracket was between 70 and 80%. Yeah, that means if you earned a dollar at the top tax bracket, 70% of it went to the government or 80%. Wow, then look how it dropped during the roaring 20s. In the late 20s, early 30s, it dropped down into the mid 20s and then back up slowly, way up, back up into that 90% tax bracket back during World War II, all right? That was a reality. And I, I call that out because a lot of people don't know tax brackets were high. It's not new. Tax brackets were very high many, many years back. And then what they've done is since 1960, they've tried to find a way to bring the tax brackets down. And you can see they went from 90% down to 70%, down to 50, all the way down to the 30s and then the mid to high 30s now. So that's where they are today. So I like to show that chart so people can see a protective a process of how far tax brackets have really gone over the years. All right. Let's get to legacy planning. I know we're running short on time, and I want to try to get to all your questions. Legacy planning. Oh, is it important to have legacy planning? It sure is. Legacy planning is what are we going to do with these assets that you have accumulated? What's going to happen to them when you pass away? Well, it's so, so important to make sure your wishes are known. How do you, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, that's called a will. That's your, they call it the last will and testament, right? Your last written will and testament. You're telling people that you've left behind what you would like to do with your assets. Who should get them? When should they get them? And how do they get them? That's all part of the will and trust. Trusts are a legal process and a document too, where you can actually have some management and control of those assets beyond death. Okay, so you got a will and you got a trust. You've got donation plans and strategies. You've got powers, uh, powers of attorney that's before you pass away. But powers of attorney is so critically important of if I become mentally unable to make my decisions for me. Um, or if I uh, become quite ill right now and uh, I need someone to make some decisions on my behalf. That's a power of attorney. So all of these legacy planning issues have to be thought about. And that's something we bring up when we counsel clients is do you have a will? Do you have a trust? What happens if something happens to you? We see, we've seen this quite, quite prominently here during the whole COVID time. People got sick, people passed away. They were not expecting that sometimes. And the reality is some of these leftover issues needed to be addressed. If you don't have a will when you pass away, let me share this. There is arrangements for you already written by the government, and they'll tell your family who gets those assets and when will they get them and how they get them. You don't want to use that if you don't need to, right? I think if I had it, my brothers, I'd like to make sure my family members knew exactly how my assets would like to be dispersed. So I urge you all, and some of you may have parents or even grandparents or even great, great grandparents on this call. I urge you to make sure they have already taken some good steps in this area of making sure their legacy plan has been thought about, but also written about and already executed. Very, very important. All right. All right. Okay. I call this out is because people are living a lot longer. Um, this chart is a great life expectancy chart from birth. Uh, look in the, in the 1800s, uh, the life expectancy of a person was in their uh, 40s. But with medical care and advancements, you can see that has continued to progress straight up. And you can see it go right up all the way to now life expectancy is in the high 70s, early 80s for people, people that are females. But the reality is people are living longer each and every year. 
Now, this last year, there was a little bit of a dip off uh, on mortality rates. But, the, but if you look at the scheme of things where things are going, uh, we're going to see people living a lot, lot longer. Um, when I look at this chart, too, I like to call something out is that when Social Security was introduced in the 30s, if you look at that, in the 30s, life expectancy was in the 50s, late 50s, actually, 58, 59, 60. And when they set up Social Security, they said, oh, guess what? If you live to 65, we're going to give you a retirement benefit. Well, in many cases, people never got that point. They died before they even were eligible for Social Security. Um, <clears throat> now, if you look, uh, it, using our age 65, 67 analogy for Social Security, look, people are living well, belong, well beyond that. So people are getting Social Security on average when they uh, have a life expectancy well into the late 70s, early 80s. But you have a plan. You have a plan, right? Okay, let's start talking about how do you measure up, all right? How do you measure up? And this is a fun part. I wish I was there in person. I wish I was standing in front of you because I like to do this illustration. I don't know if I can do it really well here, but I'll give it a try here, okay? There are three stages of life I'd like you to think about as you think about your planning and your uh, life. The first stage, I call it the, the <clears throat> life events of learning, okay? So let's talk about learning. And that's from zero to 30. Oops, let me go back here. Zero to 30 is what we call the learning stage. And now I usually hold up a tape measure. I've got a tape measure right here in front of me. I don't know if you can see that very well with the, with the Zoom cameras. It's not doing well, I see. But if I hold up a tape measure, that's 30 inches. So from zero to 30, people are in their learning stage. You're learning about your career. You're learning a, a vocation. You're learning a way to generate assets or generate uh, uh, ass, uh, accumulate assets, et cetera. <clears throat> By the time you turn 30, though, you're already now well getting into your career stages. And from 30 to 60, and that's when I hold up the tape measure, 30 to 60, that's 30 inches. Uh, that's called your earning stage. So you went from the first 30 years of your life, the learning stage, to the next stage of life, I call it the earning stage. You're earning money, you're earning assets, you're accumulating assets, you need to invest those assets or invest a portion of them. So for the last 30 years of your life, from age 60 to age 90, okay, that's called the burn, burning years. <laughs> Why do I call it burning years? Burning years is you're using up or burning up the assets that you have set aside for investment purposes to enjoy during your retirement. People don't set aside enough money sometimes. And when it comes to, to retire, guess what? They don't have as much money in their retirement accounts as they need to, to enjoy a retirement. Now, who's, who's, whose fault is that? Well, there's obviously outside influences that will affect it. But I would also call it out. It's important for us as individuals to take our responsibility seriously. We need to make sure we're planning accordingly what we can do and what we do have control of is doing what we can to set money aside and invest it accordingly. So these life events, reality check-in, I like to call that. So where do you stand? We're going to talk about 401k balances. That's probably the most popular retirement vehicle now people have during their working time with an employer is 401ks. <clears throat> So I'll ask this question. People ask me, well, how do I know I'm on a good track? Am I on track to retire successfully? How much do I really need in my 401k to retire, right? Well, it really is very individual. It's individualized to you and to what your needs are. Maybe you have wealth from another source. Maybe you have inherited money. Maybe... Uh, you have found a way to win it, okay? However you've gotten or accumulated assets, that also factors into the equation of how much do you need in your 401k? But I found this, I love this chart and this analysis that Fidelity had done. Fidelity had done some analysis and said, okay, let us come up with a way for people at different ages to think about how much money 
do they need in their account, their 401k account, to be, quote, on track for a successful retirement? Now, successful retirement doesn't mean you're going to have oodles and oodles and oodles of money and you could go crazy. Uh, we're calling a, uh, calling a life stage adjustment of almost nothing. So when you retire, your life stage and your life needs will remain the same, right? So if you're at age 30, for any of you that are under 30, you've got hope. Any of those that are actually 30 years old, I ask you this question. Do you know how much money you made? Do you have that amount of money in your 401k account today? Think about it. All right, let's go fast forward. We'll go to age 40. 40. Now, you know how much you're making income-wise. Take your income, multiply it by three. Do you have three times your income in your 401k account and you're at age 40? Okay, it keeps going up, doesn't it? At age 50, it's six times, 55, seven. Uh, age 60, there we go, eight times at age 60. And then at age 70, there's 10 times your income. Because once you get to that number, that nest egg would be large enough, hopefully, to be able to in be invested appropriately and be able to generate enough money off of that portfolio, along with Social Security, that you would have a retirement that would be comfortable and meet all of your needs and not have problems. And that's what Fidelity had done in their analysis. So it's great. You can even check out that website there if you want but it's really kind of cool how they've done their analysis and back filling and back with back testing what people may need in their, uh, in their income. So you need to make sure you are setting money aside. All right. All right. Let me close it up with some takeaways because they're wrapping it up. I think we're still on track. Uh, are we good on track? Okay, good. Some takeaways. Start your opium plan. Right, we talked about OPM, organize, plan and project, and then the M is manage and monitor. Are you doing that effectively for yourself? The next I'd like to make sure you know about and remember is your takeaway is what? The five areas of a wealth plan. Capital accumulation, risk management, retirement planning, tax planning, and estate planning. Now, if you can't do all this yourself, then you need to seek counsel, right? Find an advisor that you feel comfortable with, uh, that you know uh, can help you and understand your needs, and they ask more questions uh, of you so you get to thinking about what your needs are for the long term. Then is, do you know your risk tolerance level? Wow. What's your sleep factor? If you bought an investment and it dropped 20% over a week, how would you feel about it? Uh, I think you would feel great if it went up 20%. <laughs> well, it's just the inverse. If it went down 20%, how would you feel? But if you bought that investment knowing that it will go up and down 10, 20%, up and down, up and down, and on the long term, historically, it does well, potentially, that's the plan, then you could stomach that. Can you handle that kind of volatility, that up and down? So what we do is we actually have, and Don does this with his clients, we have a risk tolerance questionnaire. It's a real short questionnaire, walking you through these questions and that the way you answer those questions will then define what your risk score would be. And what we like to do is we risk score all of our clients. We give them, they'll either be between a one all the way to 100. From one to 100, and depending upon how high you are, that helps determine what risk level you can withstand when it comes to managing your assets. So monitoring that and understanding what your risk level score is, is important. We like to do this even with our existing clients or somebody that's coming in. They may have had their assets managed by somebody else. They may uh, have been on an investor on their own, for example. We'll ask them these questions and a risk score will come out. The risk score may come in at 48, 47, right? Well, when we do the analysis on their portfolio, their risk, the risk level on their portfolio might even be as high as 80, 90. It's like, whoa, no wonder you're nervous all the time because your portfolio is much more 
risky. It's designed to be more volatile than what you can even stomach. So let's get this in alignment. Let's bring that volatility down and match up your risk tolerance to the actual portfolio design you should maybe look at, right? So knowing what that is, is important. All right, let's keep going. Compare all the investments that you ever look at. Whenever you look at any investment, ask that question in your head, what's the style about that investment? Okay, will it be safe? Will it have taxes? What's the yield? What's the liquidity? And how will it affect my estate? There you go, the S-T-Y-L-E. Make sure you do that. Then managing your life risks, right? Making sure you understand all those risks. Very premature death. How am I going to leave any family members behind financially? Am I going to leave any major financial debts or, or burdens behind? Uh, if I became disabled, how will I be able to live? Where will I get my income from? Uh, then property loss, making sure you have your house and your home, uh, your, your, even if you're renting, your tenants insurance, and making sure that's in a good alignment along with your um, uh, long-term care needs. Uh, making sure you think through those as well. And auto insurance, I meant, to, I meant to say auto insurance. So making sure you have all those risk levels carried forward. Then last but not least, start now. Start planning and acting now. Because the sooner you do it, that you now have the strongest tool in your toolbox when it comes to building your own wealth plan. The strongest tool that you'll ever have in your, in your toolbox is, uh, is time. And if you waste it and you don't use time on your benefit for growth and for investment purposes, it makes it a lot harder. Here's a good analogy I like to use. Let's suppose you're all in Tucson, right? And I say, you need to be in Tucson or you need to be in Phoenix. That's about what, 90 minutes away, right? Okay, so you need to be here in 90 minutes. Okay, you know you can drive the car at a reasonable speed and be there on time 90 minutes before you need to be there, right? You start you start in Tucson and you drive your 65 or 75 miles an hour that you know you need to go and you will arrive on time in Phoenix, generally without accidents, okay? Let's hopefully. But if you wait and you say, no, I'm not gonna leave right now. I'm gonna wait a half an hour. Oh, wow. You wanna wait a half an hour? When do you wanna leave? Oh, I'll leave in a half an hour from now. And that will only though give you 60 minutes to get to Phoenix. How much more, how much faster do you need to drive now? A lot faster. Is that safe? No, uh, not safe for yourself or for others. And you will actually now create extra risk issues in your trans, in your journey to get to where you need to go. So the longer you wait, it's like that analogy of the car, the longer you have to work with. So if you had six hours to get to Phoenix, Guess what? You could really enjoy your drive. You could stop a few times, do a few things, enjoy the ride versus all of a sudden now being under the gun and not having that ability to get there on time. So let's do that action now. All right, I'm done. I'll close it up. Questions, you can email us. You can ask us. I know there's some that are coming in the chat box. So I'll turn it back to you. I think it's Renee is the host or whoever else is the host here to answer questions for Don and myself. All right, so we did have a few questions come in through the chat. Um, the first one is, I have 20% from each paycheck, but in, I so I save 20% from each paycheck, but instead of just putting that in my money market account in my bank, how can I add that into an investment or fund on a monthly basis? Sure, if, um, if, I, if I can maybe chime in on that. Absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, uh, you know, thank you very much for that question. Twenty percent of each paycheck. I'm I'm really impressed. I'd, I'd say you're off to a wonderful start. Whoever uh, brought in that question, and uh, one of the ways that, or one of the things that you, if you don't have already, that I would highly recommend would be a Roth R O T H I R A Roth I R A. What that's going to allow you to do, depending on your age, you're allowed to put in six thousand uh, dollars a year into that Roth. If you're over age 50, it is now $7,000 called the catch-up provision. Um, we can actually set up a monthly plan uh, through 1AZ Wealth Management and LPL Financial, where you would pick a day and a dollar amount. And then that on, most people pick the 15th. And then on the 15th of every month, 
that dollar amount gets transferred from your checking account or your savings account into your LPL financial account. And then we would maybe look at an investment such as a, depending on your risk tolerance, you, you would be able to add to that investment every month and watch it continue to grow over time. But that's that's one of the one of the main things that I would I would certainly do. And over time, you will see uh, that um, if you're in it for the long run, you're going to do far better with a, with a good balanced or a good growth or a little bit of a both mutual fund than you would ever do in leaving your money in a uh, money market account for the next 20 years. And just for one more minute, I'd, I'd just like to throw in a little tip here, if I could, please. This is called the rule of 72. And it's very, very easy. It's very, very easy rule. Let's say you have an investment that's paying on average 9% a year. Well, you take 72 divided by nine. Your, in, your, your investment is going to take eight years to double. If you're lucky enough to find a money market account paying 2%, 72 divided by two, it's going to take you 36 years to double your money. Just a little, little point I'd like to throw out. Great. I'm impressed too. 20% of your pay. Excellent. Make yeah. sure you have your emergency funds set aside. Make sure you have adequate investments set aside for emergencies. But beyond that, absolutely. You could start investing and I would encourage that. Okay. So we, we're getting a lot more questions come in, but I'm going to go with the questions that came in first. Um, okay. The next one is what if I'm already disabled? How should I adjust my investment plans to be better prepared? Don, do you want to handle that one or do you want me to yeah. take it? Uh, someone being disabled, um, how to better adjust your investment plans. You, we would have to sit down and, and again, go through that OPM process. I would, you know, first the organized plan and prepare. I would like to see an aerial photo of, of all about your life, your finances. What are your bills every month? How much do you need uh, guaranteed money to live? And uh, once we establish, you know, we plan and prepare, we'll eventually monitor if you like what you hear, but it's basically what's more important to you. Are you looking to get more income every month? We have, we have some investment vehicles that will pay you an income for life. And we, we find out what's most important to you. You tell us what you're looking for. We will work around a problem to help you find the work around the problem to help you find your resolution. Yeah. I just to take tag onto that. Uh, like I agree with you, John is it's really knowing what your goals and objectives are. Um, and knowing what those goals and objectives are, we have to then manage around what we have, right? It's, it's, um, it's a process. Uh, there is no magic uh, formula. Uh, and when someone is already in the dis disability mode, there are certain techniques and vehicles you can use. Um, I don't know if they know that if they're uh, classified as permanently disabled, uh, you can get to your IRA funds without a 10% uh, penalty early. You can, so there are investment sources, or I'll say them financial resources that you can utilize uh, during these events, for example, disability. Thank you. Okay. So um, what can people do if they're, if they're getting started late on investing? Okay. Um, well, once again, we, we would probably set up a budget and we would find out after getting getting the picture, after getting the entire aerial picture, we would find out what they would like to have but at, at the time that they choose to retire. And then we would create a financial plan and we would actually get pretty close and accurate to how much money you're going to need to put away every month in order for you to reach that goal. Now, some a lot of a lot of us that have uh, pensions that will be coming in. I know it's a dying thing in the uh, United States, but a lot of us that have pensions coming in after a certain amount of years of service or a certain amount of time with the company are going to need less than obviously those that are just strictly going to be relying on their 401k and social security. But if you're starting late in life, I mean, simple rule of thumb, the more you can put away now, the better you're going to be uh, down the road. Yeah, I mean, agree. And I'll, I'll add on to that, too. The most important thing is, since you are coming in a little later, don't be, uh, don't be fooled into thinking you need to be a lot more aggressive. Unfortunately, some people become more aggressive because they have such a short time horizon 
and then they regret that seriously because time is important to allow that volatility, as I talked about earlier. And if you try to rush that, then you um, you certainly can find yourself in a bad way if um, if the markets don't cooperate or the, you know your plan doesn't cooperate. So it's as Don said, you got to make sure you think through the process, look at all the resources, and then build a plan together. Look, there's a calculation we do to show exactly what number you need, and then. Sometimes you have to have a, a process to say, well, I can't retire at 65. Right. Uh, you're going to have to wait until you're 68. Or, or maybe you need a part-time job for a few years uh, right. to bridge it. So there's those ways we work through the formulas. Sorry, Carly. Awesome. Okay. So what is a 403B or how is a 403B different from a 401K? Sure. Um, usually here, they're very, very similar in plans. Uh, 403Bs are commonly used as a retirement plan and a 401k or a 403b. Usually these retirement plans consist of a limited pool of mutual funds. You get to select um, maybe five or six or seven. You get to uh, select, are you low risk, middle risk, high risk, or are you a little bit of a combination of both? You can allocate your funds in certain, uh, your monies into different levels of risk funds. 403B plans are primarily used by nonprofit organizations, say such as uh, universities, uh, schools, goodwill, uh, religious organizations. 401Ks are very, very similar, but uh, used by mostly companies that are for profit. And Tom, please, if you have anything to share on that. Nope, that's, that's pretty much the same. Okay. Good to know. Okay, um, where can I learn about life insurance policies? that are also savings accounts? Insurance accounts, savings accounts. Uh, well, answer that one. Uh, first, uh, first step, you might want to set an appointment with me. <laughs> but uh, um, life insurance policies itself, uh, basically, there's basically, well, there's a, more types of life insurance policies, but just to keep it simple, term and perm. Term policy. Who do you love? How much do you love them? How much, how much do you want to ensure that, or what are you looking to ensure? I mean, it, it, it's a certain time limit, 20 years at $100,000. However, though, with the term policy, if you outlive that 20 years, that policy is null and void. And if you try to obtain another 20-year policy, it's going to be more because you're now 20 years older. Permanent, though, it's guaranteed to pay. You have, they have whole life where you can put up a simple sum of money and get written into a contract that... Uh, once you, you pay up front, you're guaranteed this amount uh, at your death, or you can uh, guarantee universal life. You can make monthly payments and build up that policy, and policies will often have cash value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that, that's good. I'll, I'll add to this that I, I, I believe in insurance. I know it's a very powerful tool. However, be careful. Insurance is for insurance purposes, in my mind. Uh, and so many times people think, well, I'll put everything in the insurance and that'll be my everything. Well, insurance is a, has a purpose for insurance. Investments have a purpose for investments. I think you can do a little bit of both. You need to make sure you understand both and make sure you fully understand the, the different vehicles. Um, insurance serves a wonderful purpose, but uh, don't be insurance poor. Some of you know that or hear that term. Uh, but most important is making sure there's a balance and a strategy in place. Uh, as I say, uh, making sure you understand the difference between term and whole life or permanent insurance. Uh, there's a need for both. And there's some wonderful tax advantages when it comes to insurance that you need to think about. Wonderful tax advantages. You know, if you die, those, de those death benefits can be, can be tax-free. You know, million-dollar policy have tax-free benefits of a million dollars. That's, that's a big, big win. But you need to make sure it's organized and owned correctly, as well as uh, placed correctly. But that's another subject. We could do a deep dive on insurance if anyone knows, wants to know more. Yeah, we, we might have to expand our, our events with you guys. <laughs> okay. okay, the next one is, is it a better investment to pay off my mortgage early or to use the money to invest? Okay. I, you know, I, I'd like to maybe possibly share on that. And you might actually get a little bit different opinions from different financial advisors on that. I mean, let's first take a look at uh, how much is your mortgage? What is the interest rate that, uh, that you're paying on that mortgage? Let's take a look at your investment portfolio. 
how much uh, annual return have you received over the last, uh, say, uh, 10 years? What's your 10-year average? We try to find a, a happy medium. And uh, some people, it would be I'd, more advantageous to pay off their home early and some, not necessarily. If you're if you have a mortgage that you're paying, say, four or four and a half percent on, but then again, you know, you're making an averaging six or seven or eight or nine percent returns on your investments. Well, you know, maybe it'd be more advantageous to hang on to those investments as opposed to pay off your mortgage. Every every situation is unique. Every situation is uh, is, is is quite different. Yeah. All right. The next one is, would you, would you please elaborate a little more on annuities? I've been thinking about buying it, but some say there are a lot of hidden fees. Okay, sure. Um, sure. There's three types of annuities. And, uh, you know, I, I could probably spend another hour uh, explaining the three types. Uh, <laughs> there's three types of annuities. You have, first of all, you have fixed, then you have indexed, and then you have variable. Um, a lot of, I know annuities get a lot of a lot of times they get a bad rap, uh, but that's just simply because people do not understand them. A fixed annuity is some, it's plain as say vanilla ice cream. Three year, five year, seven years, some are even for 10 years. We will give you 2.75%. You get interest paid every month. You have a three year contract in front of you. At the end of three years, that, that's it. You, you get your money back and you continually get your 2.75%. There's, there's no fees in that. The exact dollar amount that you invest in, unfortunately, it's usually a minimum of 10000 though. That's all you pay. You will not pay any fees or any commissions on top of that. That's all you pay. Indexed annuity. Indexed annuities usually have two buckets. They have a fixed bucket, and it usually pays right around 2% in today's, today's market. Then you also have the rest of some of your money. You can, part, you can split your money up either way you'd like. You're also mirroring an index, commonly such as the S&P 500. Let's just go ahead and make math very, very easy here. Let's say the day that you sign your contract, the S&P 500 was at 1,000 points. A year later, let's say that the S&P finishes at 1,070, indicating a 7% gain. Well, your account gets credited in today's market about 5%. There's, a, there's always a cap rate on that, on that indexed annuity. No chance of loss. If the index is lower from the year that you invested in, you don't make money that year, but you don't lose any money that year. But the money that you do have in the fixed bucket will be guaranteed to pay every month. That's an index annuity. Again, no fees. And as long as you hold it to term, no loss. Um, the variable the product, I, I won't go too deeply into that. You will pay commissions and fees on that, but your money is basically invested into different mutual funds, but they usually offer a floor or a buffer, such as if uh, cert, one certain fund goes down, say, 15%, you might be covered for the first 10, and you might take a 5% loss. But uh, yeah, it is a little bit more of a complicated product. But yes, there are fees and commissions on that. It could be anywhere from 2 to 3%. Thank you for explaining that. I didn't sure. realize there were so many different options. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, not only different options, the carriers, the insurance companies will create different versions of the product that add complexities. So a buyer be educated. No, don't be buyer beware, just buyer be educated. Please educate yourself on understanding them. Like I've had clients have had annuities for 30 or 40 years and they're very, very happy. And then sometimes people, they're just not, an annuity doesn't cure the common cold as they say. They have a specific purpose and they do a very good and important job. But the most important thing doesn't meet the needs and objectives of the client. Right. And is that your need? Is that your objective? So be uh, be sensitive and be uh, careful and being thoughtful through the process. And we'll even do a, a free look and a free analysis for anybody that needs it. Awesome. So we, we still have several questions, but I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all of them. So we have a yeah. few more minutes for some questions. Um, the next one is there a minimum amount required to start investing? Uh, sure. I'd, I'd be happy to explain that, too. Um, it, here, here at One Easy Wealth Management, we have we have three styles of accounts basically that uh, that that especially I like to utilize. One is the traditional brokerage account. Now, this is a commission based account. You know, you buy a product, you pay a commission. You sell a product. In most cases, you pay a commission. Minimum on that, we would like to at least see one thousand dollars to start. Now, with one thousand dollars, though, you do have a, a few investment options, but. Uh, 
what I would like to see, especially from a younger investor, if they open up their account with $1,000, I'm happy to help you. But show me that you're really serious. Can you contribute $50, $100 a month? Can you put it through automatic ACH every month, the 15th of every month? Can you spare $50 where it automatically goes into your account? Can you spare $100 where it automatically goes into your account? That's uh, that, To me, if somebody can do that or even more, it shows me that they're very serious. $1,000 is usually what we ask for for a traditional brokerage account. We do have advisory style accounts where they are professionally managed. However, the minimums on those accounts. Go ahead, Tom. No, yeah, they, they and they different investment categories will have different minimums. But the, I think you answered it properly. $1,000 can get you started. Most mutual funds, too, that we'll use uh, generally uh, will have a typically a minimum of 1000 out there. Some, uh, some may even have as low as 250, but it's getting fewer and fewer because uh, just the cost of investing and the cost of doing business, uh, the fund companies and the investment options uh, have some higher minimums, but that's just to get started. But the add-ons, that's where the real win is. And I'll mention that as again, to Dawn's benefit is that for the key call out here is don't stop, keep going. Um, and by buying, on, buying in on a regular routine basis, that technique is called dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging, that allows you to buy things sometimes high and you're hopefully buying some things low. So on average, you're buying at prices that will average out for the benefit for yourself on the long term. So the key is keep doing it, keep, keep it doing and keep going uh, and making sure you utilize as much time in your formula as you can. Okay, just so, to be sensitive to people's time, I'll just turn it back to you, uh, folks. And if anybody has questions, um, I think I have that up on the screen now. Questions, you can email us, you could um, call us, uh, and uh, we'll be able to help you. There, there's our scan code for that. I want to just say last words. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share and educate some folks and hopefully made a difference in people's eye and minds. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Carla. Thank you. Sorry about that. We I know we have some questions and we can always share uh, some of the information. Thank you, Tom and Don, for the information that you shared with us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. Um, yeah, let me stop sharing here for you. There you go. Thank you. Awesome. So can you all see my screen? All right, so really quick, we wanted to share um, some resources that we put together for you, investments and retirement. There's a lot of videos, uh, information, mm -hmm. activity. Um, so we will be sharing that via email with you all. And as well, announce that um, those of you that we want to thank you for, for following us on social media, for first year experience, and for the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarship. So um, those of you that did follow us, uh, you were entered in a drawing. And so right now you'd be hearing a drum roll. So pretend that. And the winners are, so congratulations to Gigi McBride. Are you here? And Philip Aguilar, are you here? Um, and so what you are winning is um, a price bundle, which you can see a picture on your screen. Um, these prize options from are from our from Pima Community College, from both the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships and for your ex first year experience, uh, we will send your price packages soon to the mailing addresses provided in your MyPima student profile. So um, we thank you for that. And then as well, we um, please allow at least a few weeks for us to get these things um, delivered to you in the mail. Um, if you have not received your price by this time next month, please follow up with us. Um, so we can troubleshoot and track down your price. And you can follow up with us at scholarships at pima.edu. And last but not least, um, you know, we do have a uh, survey. We want to hear from you. We want to we want to uh, know how we did today. Um, any information that you can share with us about our session today. And um, and just again, thank everyone for attending to um, our Money Matters session and let you know that we do have another session coming up uh, in two weeks, April 28th at 4.30 p.m. 
uh, the topic is borrowing. So please RSVP at the link that will be shared shortly in the chat. And reminder that when you do attend all three sessions, um, you are you will be entered for a drawing for a $250 award to be applied to tuition at Pima either for this summer or next upcoming fall semester. So please, please take a moment to complete uh, the survey and let us know your feedback is greatly appreciated. And a huge, huge thanks again to our partners from 1AZ Credit Union. Um, Patrick, Tom, Don, thank you so much for the information you provided. Life changing. I learned a lot. Um, I'll be reaching out, by the way. Um, so thank you so much for the information. Um, and uh, we will be including a link in our chat about the um, web page between Pima and 1AZ Credit Union. There are some benefits for students that um, uh, work with 1AZ. And Again, thank you so much for our part, our Pima partner, first year experience, Renee and Juanita for joining us today. We appreciate your time and uh, we will be uh, emailing certificates of completion um, as well within a few weeks. So thank you so much for your time again today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So I think we'll stick around for a few minutes while students want to complete their surveys. Um, and then if they have any questions they want to add, then we can put them in our in our document that we can get answered. And sorry, survey on the screen, apologies. And then our contact information as well. When is the next um, seminar? Um, the next uh, session will be April 28th at 4.30 p.m. as well. Um, it is a Thursday, um, so it's coming up in two weeks. And um, we will be sharing the RSVP link um, in the chat Great. for you. Thank you. So we look forward to seeing you there, Scott. Appreciate that. Yep, this was, this was good. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a good Thanks night. For join Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Bye now. All right. Have a good night. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks Bye. for joining Bye, us. Bye, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Bye-bye. Uh,